Asian gangs are taking control of Britain's deadly heroin trade. Brutal and ruthless, they'll stop at nothing. They target young people, they give you out for free. They defend their turf and their profits to the death. This is not a business for nice people. And they look set to become even more powerful. Even the police are worried that they are unstoppable. They're strong, big guys and they, they will fight and take a lot of the turf. Tonight we're going to go undercover right into the heart of these gangs to discover how they operate and why they're so successful. I'm Raggy Omar and I'm on a journey. Crisscrossing the whole country, from Aberdeen to Southampton, London to Liverpool. And I want to understand the violent gangs, the high-tech fraudsters, and the sophisticated criminal gangs that now make up Britain's new underworld. Thirty tons of heroin enters Britain every year with a street value of almost two and a half billion pounds. Until now, most of this has been controlled by Turkish gangs, but their influence is under threat from Asian heroin gangs, Pakistani, Bangladeshi and Indian. We will go undercover to watch these Asian heroin gangs at work. I'll be meeting an ex-dealer who'll reveal some of his trade secrets. I'll speak to the authorities who are fighting to stop the spread of these deadly gangs. And I'll tell the story of one Asian heroin gang that laundered an incredible quarter of a billion pounds of drugs money right here in Britain. It's 5 p.m. on a busy street in London's East End and a heroin deal is going down. This man has just bought heroin from two Asian dealers inside the car. As he walks away, he puts it in his mouth for safety. The dealers in the car are the last stage of a sophisticated criminal network that stretches all the way to the poppy fields of Afghanistan. Asian crime networks are now controlling the street trade in heroin in many towns and cities in Britain, including Bradford, Manchester, Glasgow and Sheffield. But for my story, I'm looking at the gangs that operate here in the London borough of Tower Hamlets. Situated right next to the city of London, Tower Hamlets was once the stamping ground of white gangsters such as the Craze, but the area has now been taken over by Asian heroin gangs. London's East End has always been a place in which immigrant communities have made their home. In the 1950s, the first Bangladeshis arrived. When they came here, they wanted to establish themselves as a new community and open shops in what was a traditionally almost exclusively white area. Now the Bangladeshis who live here make up one of the largest ethnic communities in Britain. But the area is poor. Seven out of ten children are living on the breadline and unemployment rates are amongst the worst in the country. Inevitably, many are being drawn into a life of crime selling heroin. I went out at night to speak to some boys on the streets of Tower Hamlets who told me more about this deadly trade. They were as young as 15 and although they weren't dealers themselves, they were fully aware of the heroin deals conducted on their doorsteps. They told me that heroin and the dealers are everywhere. Wherever you go to the dealer? Dealers are really like obvious. I can yeah. just go up and say, listen, I need this if I want it. For many kids growing up here, it can be hard to resist the temptation of joining gangs. They get like bare cars and stuff like people get influenced by that. What's the youngest? 12, 13. Serious? Yes. Yeah, How much would they earn then? 250, 300 pounds a week. A 12 hour shift every day. Yeah. Like five days a week. I was amazed to hear that the dealers attracted customers with the kinds of offers associated with supermarket promotions. Two for 15, that's what people call it. One black, one white. One hair and bowl, one crack Yeah, three for 20. Three for 20, two for 15. That's incredible. But they also resort to more sinister means. They target young people, they give you out for free. So they try and actually get people hooked as yeah, well. It's not just. Well. Really? Yeah. There is a girl getting very anxious. She's got money in her hand. You're looking at footage taken by a former undercover policeman who we sent onto the streets of Tower Hamlets to film Asian heroin gangs at work. She keeps using her mobile phone. Our cameraman, who used to work as a surveillance officer at Scotland Yard, has spotted a woman who he thinks has all the signs of someone waiting for a heroin fix. She's clutching the money in her hand. You can just see corner of the notes. Looks like two ten pound notes. 
The money in her hand is a giveaway sign. Heroin dealers will never give the drug on credit, just in case their client isn't alive to pay the debt the next day. Looks like she's getting very anxious now. Sure enough, a black car soon draws up. Black Toyota. It's two uh, Asians. Our cameraman thinks this black car contains dealers for a gang who have just pulled up and supplied heroin to the woman. He goes on the chase. He sees them doing at least 10 deals in a three hour period. He suspects that they actually do 50 to 60 every day. He's now gone into an office, the one with the striped t shirt, and obviously just done a delivery in there. There was another deal that just came through um, very, very quick, and they're off up the street and into the flats there. There's two of them went to two different addresses. And he's coming back to the car. He's getting in. The deal's just come down. An Asian fella and a white fella both picked up from the car. Our retired police officer, who's seen many of these deals, remarks on how they work. And they're off very, very quick. They're obviously experts, and this is how every one of the deals has gone down. These street dealers are members of one of up to 20 Asian heroin gangs operating in Tower Hamlets. Later, I'll hear how Asian gangs smuggle the heroin into Britain on a massive scale. But first, I wanted to know more about how the street dealing side of their operations work. So we sent another undercover cameraman to see if he could score heroin from the same gang. I was meeting, waiting for some junkies as they taught me out. Um, you don't want to try the junkies, mate. He soon meets a man who works for them. He's known in gang terms as a spotter, the person who watches the patch and looks out for trouble and customers. He quickly gets in touch with the dealers. It's coming in five minutes, boss. The spotter is an addict himself. Like many of those at the bottom of the heroin supply chain, he works for his gang in return for heroin. I'm taking it for nine years, boss. Nine, nine years? Yeah. Nine years I'm taking it for, boss. I fucking hate it. Oh, no, they're here, boss. Got the dealers arrive, but they won't meet our cameraman yet. They're not stupid and would never meet a potential client straight away in case they were an informer. I don't want to introduce you straight away. No, no. I'll tell him. Yeah. It's all about building up a relationship. Our cameraman went back the next three days, and it was only on the last day that he finally met them alone. Yeah, can I have one color? Just in case they're being watched, rather than pulling up at the appointed place, the dealers stop 50 meters up the road and our cameraman has to run to their car, a tactic designed to dodge any surveillance teams who may be onto them. Once again, the deal's done in a flash. We took what we bought to a government-approved lab to be tested. They confirmed that it was indeed heroin and that like most heroin bought on the streets, it was only 30 to 40 percent pure. But who's really controlling the dealers on the street? I tracked down a gang mastermind who sold heroin in Tower Hamlets for four years before being caught. It's incredibly rare that a major dealer speaks out. Fearing reprisals, he would only talk if we agreed to keep his identity a secret. Like many young men who get involved in this world, he started dealing to fund his own heroin habit when he was only 19. I knew a couple of people who were actually selling heroin and I kind of got involved with them and I'd, I started working for them uh, six months after that. Um, got some money together and started it myself. He soon became a major player. He claimed that he used to control a five mile patch selling a kilogram of heroin a week to 50 customers, making a weekly profit of £9,000. You need to know how, how to make money. You need to have a business mind anyway. He told me he would ensure his team of 10 street dealers would be yeah. constantly supplied and he would make sure that he was yeah. never seen. Someone would call up to me, mm. right, like, I need a reload, that's right. what they call it. There would be a middleman between me and them. Right. So nothing can kind of put me... Be traced back. Yeah. And like all good businessmen, he knows exactly how to find potential clients. He took me to a local job center where, incredibly, he used to target customers by handing out his phone number to junkies queuing up for their benefit checks. We knew there was a lot of money to be made here mm. from, from this actual place itself. You see that phone box there? Uh, normally we get a lot of people calling for drugs really from the job centre, they'd get their gyro, go to the post office, cash it, there's a phone box straight outside, ideal really. Believe me, when it gets busy you can't really even sit down and have a, have a break, you know, it's, everything's on the go. As he told me more, I felt I was talking to a company manager rather than a heroin dealer. So organised was his business that the street dealers even had expense accounts. They'd be able to spend run about say £20 each. 
uh, per shift anyway on say cigarettes, food, whatnot. Um, they also have another 10, 15 pounds to maximum 20 pounds for petrol. As long as, now, as, long as I got the receipts and I know the money's not going so into it's, it's the amazing thing is just sort of one side of it is almost like a sort of an investment bank. Yeah. I mean, there are expense accounts, there are receipts, there are, you know. Uh, we try and give people, I mean, you know, a chance to kind of, as well as myself, to make money anyway. Um, everything's there for you. I want you to do well. But he told me the kind of things that would happen if people got out of line. You'd start um, inflicting uh, pain on him, um, I a razor blade, you know, just kind of brushing it against his skin and all that, uh, to punch him, to stubbing cigarettes out on him, and, you know, you'd even tie him up sometimes. You'd have to, there's no two ways about it, really. You tried being a nice guy, but this is not a business for nice people anyway. This extreme violence underlies the business operations of all Asian heroin gangs. But the people who really get affected by it aren't the major players, but their foot soldiers, the street gangs. I went to talk to some boys of the Brick Lane Youth Development Association, which works with the youth of the area to help them get out or keep out of gangs. There's no gangs without drug dealing. The drugs bring in the gang, the drugs bring in the violence. Drugs bring everything. Half of my friends are in that prison now. A couple of my friends are in mental hospital now. It's like, I've messed up. These boys used to be in one of the most notorious gangs in the area, the Brick Lane Massive. From an incredibly young age, they're exposed to things that I found deeply upsetting. At the age of 12, we started to go in that gang. There was about 50 of us. We used to do everything what together. Else? 10 who would fight, 10 who would deal, 10 who would do something else, like everyone like, was useful some, for something bad. In a heroin-ridden area where rival street gangs control different patches, turf walls are common. A few months before, three gang members from Brick Lane encountered a gang from a rival area. Inside two minutes, they got about 50 boys with machetes and everything. And they started beating them up, innit? But they couldn't really do nothing because the boys ran. The next day, 30 of the Brick Lane boys took their revenge. And one of them really got hurt, innit? He was in coma for two weeks because he got stabbed up. Ironically, Asian gangs in the East End, as in other parts of Britain, started in the 1970s to protect themselves against racist organizations such as the National Front. When the racist threat died down, the gangs remained. And now, rather than fighting a common enemy, they fight each other. Boys like these are brought up within a strong Bengali community, but they're also young British men. For many, falling into criminal gangs is just a way of fitting into the world around them. The East End has always had a history of, of crime. This is where Jack the Ripper was based. It's where the Cray twins uh, operated from. And so, in some senses, you could say they're just assimilating uh, to a way of life that's always been here. I've learned that Asian heroin gangs are using a lethal combination of violence and business tactics to devastating effect. Up to now, I've been looking at the gangs dealing on the streets, but in part two, I'll discover the sheer scale of these crime networks and hear a shocking story of one Asian gang that laundered an incredible 300 million pounds of heroin money. I'm Raggy Omar and I'm on the trail of the Asian heroin gangs now operating throughout Britain. As Asian heroin gangs become more common throughout the country, so crime and violence is increasing. And you don't have to be a dealer or an addict to be affected. Police believe just one kilogram of heroin leads to over 200 crimes, from importers who smuggle the heroin in illicitly, to suppliers who peddle the deadly drug, to addicts who steal to feed their habit. Detective Inspector John Collins has spent many years conducting surveillance on heroin gangs. He agreed to talk to us as long as we kept his identity a secret. The heroin business is big on family connections. Uh, and it doesn't have to be brothers and sisters. This can actually be the guy from the same village. Every year, about seven tons of heroin enters Britain via Pakistan, India and Bangladesh, usually by human mules through our airports or hidden in cargo freight. Despite the best efforts of the police and customs, only a fraction of the heroin entering this country is ever discovered. Police estimate a staggering 90% gets through. Once here, the heroin goes nationwide on the back of the Asian network. It's a close-knit community, which is hard to infiltrate. You'll get one or two families in one big town, uh, we'll say Bradford. Then you'll get another couple of families in Leeds. They'll all be interconnected. And do they ever have non-Asian partners? Rarely. Or... Uh, and that's one of their big strengths. Uh, because uh, if you have a non-Asian partner, that's the guy who's going to become the informant against you. That's the guy that hasn't got the family loyalty. 
but some gangs have been stopped. In the West Midlands, a gang were convicted of selling heroin worth almost half a million pounds. In Bradford, a British Pakistani man, Fariman Khan, was jailed for 12 years for supplying heroin and cocaine with a street value of over a million pounds. And also in Bradford, another British Pakistani, Khalid Malik, was jailed for 25 years for smuggling heroin with a street value of £7 million. I went back to my reform dealer who gave me more details on how the Asian heroin gangs operate. He showed me how he'd buy large amounts from his wholesaler. He took me to a car park in Essex where he used to conduct many of his large-scale drug deals, right under the noses of supermarket shoppers. He'd exchange money with his dealer, but the heroin would always be hidden somewhere else. It would be concealed within a packet of crisp or a cigarette box. From the way it feels up until, yes, you know, I've got, I've got the drugs kind of thing. Having picked up the heroin, he'd take it to a safe house to hide. Dealers prefer to use taxis because if they're stopped by the police, it's hard to prove that the heroin belongs to them. I'd rent a room out, I'd tell the occupier, I'd tell him that I'm either doing studies or make some kind of a believable excuse. We kind of move around every month or so. Using a heroin substitute, the ex-dealer showed me how he'd make small balls or wraps ready to be sold in the streets at £10 a bag. This is 28 grams, which is an ounce. I uh, bought it for £650, and from that, I double my profit kind of thing. I make 200%. By this stage, the heroin is only 30% pure. Dealers further up the chain would have cut it with other potentially lethal substances in order to increase their profits. It's been known to have antidepressants, sleeping tablets, rat poison, it adds to the weight. Four. That's four. In total, I'd make, say, around about 170, 180. And from that, we're taking tens and making two little balls. So then we actually tell them inside this, um, and this is what I'd supply to the guys who are selling it for me on the street. So this would be £100 worth. The street dealers keep the balls of heroin in their mouths and always carry a bottle of water with them so they can swallow them if they're stopped by the police. So it's either you vomit it out or you know, it comes at the other end kind of thing. With tactics like these, the police forces who are trying to fight the dealers have their work cut out. I've been looking at gangs in London, but heroin spreads its evil tentacles throughout the country. Peterborough is just one of Britain's cities that have been targeted by Asian heroin gangs. In Saltwood Police Station, the team are preparing for a raid on a grocery shop owned by an Indian man. Detective Inspector Nayar briefs her team. The intelligence suggests that he's selling heroin from the shop. It's been a steady flow of intelligence since March. The police vehicles gather near the shop. They are aware of three Asian heroin gangs operating in Peterborough. They suspect that their target isn't operating alone. He's likely to be part of a some form of network. Um, you know, he's, he's buying it from somebody and then distributing it to somebody else. This team conducts, on average, 12 raids on heroin gangs every month. We've got um, a warrant to search the place. Well than welcome. But this one isn't successful. They don't find any heroin. You didn't find anything. No, I'm should I have done? I don't know. You tell me. Police raids at ground level aren't the only tactics that are being used to attack Asian heroin gangs. The battle against them is a global one. Heroin might be traded in small, little £10 bags by dealers and their clients in towns right up and down the country. But heroin is also a huge international issue, and one that's being discussed at the most senior levels of governments and crime agencies in Britain. In 2006, a new FBI-style crime-busting agency was set up. The Serious and Organised Crime Agency, or Soccer, is tackling the criminal gangs targeting Britain. I went to talk to the Director General, Bill Hughes. I was amazed to hear how large-scale soccer's operations against Asian heroin gangs are. He believes that the way to take them out is to attack the labs that manufacture heroin in Afghanistan. Seizing the drug is, is important because that's important in the trial process, but actually it's not the answer. The answer is to hit the labs, 
to hit the money where they're going with that and to take out the main players who are organising it. What he brought home to me was the sheer scale on which these Asian gangs operate. He told me that they're unique in that not only do they deal the drugs at street level, but they're involved in every stage of the process, from smuggling heroin to laundering the profits. You wouldn't recognise them as being different from other business people. They need other people who are in legitimate business, people who can arrange transport, uh, people who will fix them up with uh, false companies. And if you're successful, you've got a lot of cash to deal with. Uh, what are you going to do with a lot of cash? It makes it important then to find ways in which you can launder the money, launder the cash into what appear to be legitimate businesses. This is surveillance footage of an Asian gang handling millions of pounds in a massive operation to launder heroin money. Revenue and customs officers were watching a heroin trafficker when they saw him handing over a hold all of cash to a man in a car. The officers followed the man to a travel agent's in Leeds. Over the next five months, they filmed members of the gang delivering large sums of cash from heroin dealers all over the country to the same travel agents. I went to Customs House in central London and spoke to Les Bowman, Deputy Director of Revenue and Customs, who oversaw the surveillance operation. We've got some good pictures later on of them having collected from a man from Liverpool, as you can see, holdalls full of half a million pounds at a time, roughly. One of the main couriers kept a notebook. Just as an example, between the third and the fourth, that's how many deliveries or collections he made that's to one, Ramsay. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that's just over a million quid. Good God. In two days. In total, over the four months they had followed the couriers, the officers discovered the travel agents had handled 36 million pounds. And that wasn't all. They found that two other travel agents were involved. All together, between the three of them, we reckon it was about 330 million. But they 330 mourned. million? Yeah. This case astounded me, but I realised that this was only scratching the surface. This is just a snapshot of one end of the, it of is. the chain, isn't it? It is, it is. Yeah. I've discovered that Asian heroin gangs are bigger and more powerful than I had ever imagined. They've taken on the criminal ways of British society and by applying their own particularly Asian approach have become masters of their trade. The success that Asian gangs have had has drawn on the strengths of the community itself, its business acumen and the fact that it's a close-knit society with links stretching from east to west, making it very hard to penetrate. And with the huge amounts of money involved, it's only more likely that more Asian gangs and more people within the community will be drawn to this hugely lucrative market. On the next crime invasion, the teenage gangs bringing terror to the streets of Britain. We recall seeing you know, the, the outline of a machine gun. Bullets sprayed along these walls. If we had to shoot people, people had to die, people had to die. 